one of my jobs today was to introduce people, and I've never introduced myself in front of people the way that I do others. So I'll try to zip through that, and we'll see if it uh, seems appropriate or crazy. It'll work either way. So I'm Carolyn Lawrence Dill. I'm in two different departments at Iowa State uh, University. I'm in genetics development and cell biology. I'm also in agronomy. I'm in the College of Agriculture, and that's who has funded a good deal of what it is that you're seeing today. My background is that I got a Bachelor of Arts at Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas, a master's degree at Texas Tech University, a PhD at the University of Georgia working in a cytogenetics lab, and then I moved to Iowa State University, and it surprises me to this day that I'm still here because I thought I came here to do a postdoc, but I loved it, so I'm still here. So I did a postdoc at Iowa State, and then I stayed in Ames and worked for 10 years for the USDA's Agricultural Research Service and got invited to come back to Iowa State to be on the faculty. So I've, I've always felt very lucky to be in Ames and at Iowa State. What I'm gonna do today is to give you an overview of what the Envirotron facility is. And as Bettina was saying, these kinds of activities are highly collaborative. And I'm almost afraid to get up in front of people to talk about Envirotron because like 90% of what goes on is not something I did. And if you ask me hard things about how the people that did it did it, I won't know, but I can point at somebody, <laughs> which is why I'm starting out by showing you, if I can get this to proceed, by showing you who has been involved uh, deeply. So for personnel, we have Darwin Campbell, Scott Zarekor, Yin Bao, and Anthony Chapman. Of that group, the only person that is not in this room right now is Anthony. And at the end, when you start asking questions, my guess is I'm going to be walking around the room asking other people to give answers. The PIs on the grant that supports the Envirotron are uh, Lee Tong, Thomas Luberstedt, Steve Howell, and Steve Whittem. We call them Steve H and Steve W. Both of them are sitting in this room as well. So uh, I just wanted to point out that we're all here, and the reason that we're all here is because it, it certainly takes a team to do this sort of work, and it's been a lot of fun. So here's the bigger team. The additional acknowledgments. These are all of the people that have worked on Envirotron or have supported Envirotron. So the personnel listed here are uh, people who have done a good deal of work on the facility. We also have people that work for Iowa State that are in facilities as well as ag engineering in the agronomy farm. We have lots of collaborators who have given us guidance. Um, from Percival, this has been one of those public-private partnerships where you have a group that has worked with you. For Envirotron, as you'll see in a few slides, it's really important for us to have uh, not just controlled environments, but controlled environments that are growth chambers, and those growth chambers are built for purpose. See, th these are not, if you go contact Percival and say, I want your standard uh, controlled environment growth chamber. This is something that we iteratively worked back and forth to make sure that all of the other aspects of Envirotron could actually work with what it is that they built for the program. And then finally, in addition to the NSF funding that we have from uh, the MRI program, there are donors that did some matching grants. These came from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, as well as Liberal Arts and Sciences. We also have some donor, uh, donor money from the College of Engineering and the Vice President for Research. So the entire university really has gotten behind this project. And um, it turns out the group of people that's involved in this just continues to grow, as you'll see when Marna gets up to talk a little bit about next what she's done with Envirotron. So Envirotron is a little bit different than what it is that you have seen uh, probably before and in other seminars in that traditional controlled environment phenotyping facilities that are high throughput, what you see is plants that move. They move to where the sensors are. And the main difference that we created for Envirotron was that first of all, we have a number of different controlled environments that we can grow plants in, not just one. We also have uh, designed the project to be one where the sensors are brought to the plants rather than the plants being brought to the sensors. And so what that should uh, point out to you is that 
we got really serious about controlling these environments. So when you take a plant out of its environment to image it, that's likely to cause some changes in its environment. And this, we uh, hypothesize, and I'm sure this is true, is going to cause um, some artifact in data collection. So we have multiple growth conditions, and we have this, as you see pictured here, this is the older version, but a robotic rover that brings the sensor to the plants. The Envirotron facility is laid out as you see here. So for those of you that are gonna go on the tour today, um, out at Agronomy Farm, we have this observation room where you can look through a bunch of windows and watch as the rover goes from uh, chamber to chamber using these sensors with the plants growing in the chambers. The robot goes down the, this central hallway, enters the growth chamber, and there's a red line between where the plants are and this anteroom where the rover comes in. And then the door shuts. And then a curtain comes up in between. So as you can imagine, those of you that live in Iowa especially, we create all of these little airlocks in our homes so that when you, in the winter, come into your home, you come in, you close the door behind you, and then there's another door in front of you because you have like a closet at the front of the, door of the house. Similar in other public buildings, you'll have this anteroom. We've, we've used that kind of a concept here so that when the rover comes in, the environment where the plants are is not so disturbed. So once the rover comes in, that sheet comes up and it can begin to make measurements. And over the course of an experiment, here's your robot. It moves and images in this chamber and then comes out and does the same thing in the next chamber and the next chamber and the next chamber. So if you think about how this is gonna work, you have to have a lot of uh, communication between the robot and the chamber because the chamber has to know when to open the door to let the robot in, how not to crush the robot with the door, say, um, and a number of other things. So my goal today is really just to give you an overview so that you know what, environment, uh, what Envirotron is, what some of its capabilities are, and then hopefully this afternoon you'll get to see it for yourself. The facility that we'll be going to later in the afternoon is out at the Agronomy Research Farm, and you can find that here. And these are some images that sort of dis uh, demonstrate what this vestibule concept is. So here at the front of the chamber in this image is where we grow plants. And back here, behind this curtain, this screen as it says, is where the rover comes in. This chamber camera view is a camera that's in the chamber so that we can watch what the robot's doing as it's measuring uh, plants. Sorry. So down here, you also have an aisle camera view. What those cameras enable us to do is if we're not out at Envirotron, we can still see that things are happening as we expect. And if something has gone wrong, we can uh, look and see where, uh, where in the process things have gone awry. The controls that Envirotron has include temperature, day length, light intensity, humidity, CO2, and soil moisture, and each of those ranges is shown in this table. As you can imagine, not only do you control things, you have to also measure whether you controlled them. So the part of this project that my own group is involved in is actually managing the data. So this is in telling the robot and the growth chambers how they're going to manage uh, one of these experiments and then also collecting the data to see how well we uh, manage to follow those programming uh, constraints and also to manage the data that comes out of it. So here's the robot and this, these were my musings in the middle of the night. I don't know how many of you were actually alive in the 1980s, but do you remember this guy, Johnny Five? He looks so much like that. So if any of you remember Short Circuit, you may think that we have just, you know, without trying to, built Johnny Five. So the rover has specific instrumentation, and what its head looks like is this. So it can take 3D images. We have an RGB camera on it, thermal imaging, a fluorometer probe, hyperspectral camera, a halogen light lot, line light, and uh, if you go out to the Envirotron facility today, you'll see that. And then also a laser profilometer. Are there other, um, 
looking at Sensor. the Steves. Other sensors that we've put on this just recently. This is up to date. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this is uh, this previous robot that we've used. And the reason that I put it into uh, the presentation today is so that you can see how this robot moves and how it measures the plants. So I'm going to push the button, and you're going to see a little video. This is the work of Lee Tong, who's in agricultural and, and biological engineering at Iowa State, and his postdoc, Yin Bao. What comes out of that? Here are some images. Uh, what you see here is a 3D scan and temperature. So here's our, our plant of interest. One of the things with data management that has become really clear, you'll, you'll have to talk to uh, Scott Zarekor in my lab about this, is that lining up the different points on a plant between different data types and points on a plant with different data types at a certain time and enabling a researcher to come in and make sense of this and use of it and figure out what it is they want to get out of it is not straightforward. So this is something we're working on now. Some of the images that come out of it, if you do line up all of those things, all of your planets align, is you can see uh, images where you can see the thermal, IR, and depth. And they look different. So if you look in a temperature that for the plant is fairly cold, it looks different than if it's at an optimal growing condition versus a hot growing condition. And clearly, we're not so interested necessarily in what the plant looks like. We're interested as a human in being able to see what the plant looks like so that when we go to interpret the data, we know where the data were taken. Is this on a maize midrib or is it on the edge of the leaf? Uh, did it hit exactly the same place every time it went by to measure? So there's a little bit of this data visualization that has more to do with enabling the human to understand the output than it has to do with being the output per se. So in my own group, uh, this is always a flaw that I do in presentations. If I show people the robot first and then I show them what it is we do in my group, it seems awfully boring by comparison. <laughs> so what we work on in my group is trying to enable people to set up how they're going to manage their experiments, and then how they're going to get the data out of it. So I'm showing you some screenshots of the system that Scott has developed for Envirotron. At, at the very beginning, we decided that we wanted to work with people on MyAppy. This is a group that works together worldwide uh, to create methods for defining minimal information about a plant phenotyping experiment. So you can add a lot of stuff that you want to a, to a plant phenotyping experiment, but there's a certain amount of data that if you don't put it there, other people won't understand it. So the purpose for connecting with them was to make sure that as we were documenting data, we were actually following their standards. We worked with Plantiome and Crop on using ontologies. Those are hierarchical controlled vocabularies. And then finally, we've been trying to follow the principles of FAIR so that the data will be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. What you see in this first screenshot, this is the experiment overview. You can pick what species you're working on, document what lines, uh, what the seed source was, information on uh, starting plant age. And then chamber by chamber, you can control what it is that you want that environment to be. So, for day one in chamber one, you see here that we're managing the lighting, the temperature, the humidity, but we're not managing CO2 and watering, for example. 
If we look at the chamber configuration uh, in this example, you can also see that a way to program this that is more visual is also possible. So you can look at what the chamber is anticipated or programmed to do over time. Uh, this is from uh, time 2 a.m. to 11 p.m. And it shows the days over here on the left and chambers across the top. Um, you can also, in addition to that, see uh, down at the bottom here uh, details. We also have different pot layouts, so you can have different sizes of pots that you're going to put into the chamber, and these are numbered so that when we go back we can figure out which plant was being measured, for example. And you can also look at a task list, list by chamber. So this is as an experiment is going on. You can see for chamber one, for example, what it is that is expected to be happening in that chamber over time. So here's an at a glance overview that's each chamber's uh, program for activity. And then um, we also have lists of experiments that, that other people have put together that there's something that they want to accomplish in Virotron. And uh, as they want to accomplish it, you can go in and look at how they have designed their experiment. You can duplicate an experiment if you want to do something similar and um, edit some of those parameters. So the data for, for the experiment is going to come from the researchers um, working out at the Envirotron facility. This gets loaded into the Cyverse discovery environment and data store. Um, this is going to be the design process for experimental design. And then the rover goes through and takes data. This gets stored on site, and it also gets sent to the data store. What that means is that we're, from the very beginning, on both ends, working with uh, Cyverse so that all of our operations are happening in, a, a, in, in, a, in an environment where we're not having to move data around all the time. So that is a problem for large-scale data, and this is something we've been thinking about from the beginning. The next thing that we're working on, beyond just trying to manage uh, planning experiments, is better data analysis and visualization. Some of you were probably here when Noah Falgren visited about a month ago. So we're beginning to work with Noah and Plant CV. And with that, I'm at the end of my time, and my goal was to tell you that or for you to come away from this, knowing that uh, for Envirotron, um, in that facility, the rover moves the sensors to the plant. We have multiple environments. We're trying to use community standards for the data. Um, it's available for testing. So if any of you wants to put together uh, an experiment, you can do that. And there's a website where you can go and read up a little bit more on it. So with that, are there any questions? So yeah, just out of curiosity, so what do you do if there's any sort of contamination in one chamber? Can the robot and the sensors actually move it to another chamber and in fact spread it to all the chambers? We actually have in our group somebody who genuinely works on this stuff. It's Steve. <laughs> So are, are you, ref what are you referring to, like using a pathogen or, or what? Yeah, like anything. Like sometimes you get any sort of disease on the plants or you never, you never know what you feel. Yeah, so I think um, if it's an airborne pathogen or an insect or something that could be easily spread, um, that's something we'll have to keep a really close eye on. Yeah. Um, I guess it would be possible for the spores or whatever to be carried on the on the rover or perhaps insects but yeah yeah we keep a close eye on things that are happening with the plants growing in the chambers yeah. what is our throughput <coughs> who wants to answer that yin is not around oh there you are thank you i didn't see you what is your throughput so right now we have um, 16 pots in the chamber. Uh, the amount of data is uh, 2.4 gigabytes. That includes RGB uh, image for each plant and uh, hyperspectral, uh, thermal, and 3D point cloud data. 
um, and also fluorometer data. And the three, uh, we have two types of 3D data. One is a high precision laser scan uh, data, and another one is uh, from a time of flight uh, 3D camera. It was a small number of flights. How do you manage variation? I'm sorry, can It's a small number of flags. Yeah. How do you manage variation? Variation. Small number of flag variation increases and anything in the growth chamber can cause a variation. How do you manage it? Steve, do you want that? <laughs> By testing few genotypes at a time. <laughs> so we try to have as many reps as possible. And uh, so we have actually um, in, in a typical uh, experiment, we. Um, uh, duplicate uh, chambers and have and generally run, let's say, four conditions in eight chambers, and uh, as well as having uh, as many reps, you know, with uh, individual plants as possible. So um, uh, we are uh, challenged by uh, the ex the size of the experimental space. So experimental design turns out to be extremely important in being able to set up experiments in the Envirotron. So per chamber, you have just 16 pots. So the high throughput is in, uh, I think, collecting time series data, not the number of pots, I guess. So what sort of hyperspectral camera do you have? Uh... Um, we have a Spexium FX10. It's a uh, uh, veneer from visible to near infrared 400 nanometer to a thousand nanometer so does it, it, it collects um, images like in a snapshot way rather than rastering because i guess i have few cameras hyperspectral so i if yes so the camera itself is a line scan camera so it only image one line but we have the we have a robotic arm that can rotate the camera to create a 2D image. Okay, so because I saw it when uh, it was, the sensor was taking image, I thought it, it's a, just a snapshot. So it, it, it is a line scan and yes. it rasters through to rotate to cover. So yes. how much time it takes per, uh, per, 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 plant. per plant? So we're taking um, top view hyperspectral image. Mm -hmm. So it takes about 30 seconds to scan one okay. image. Not too bad. I yeah, guess. the resolution, spatial resolution is uh, about 124 by 124, so uh, 1024 have, by 1024. Do you have to correct for the light and those things? Um, do you have to, before starting hyperspectral or no? Uh, sorry? Do you have to uh, correct it uh, for the light? And, oh, um, yes, we have, we, we collect wide reference data. Mm -hmm. So on the sensor head, there is a, um, a cylinder that can extend, and then there is a whiteboard can flip out, and we image. So total process is 30 seconds with the correction and the all taking image. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I can talk later on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have uh, okay. something wrong with my left that's ear today, okay. so okay. we can talk later. For sure. So a little bit later, we're doing the tour of the Envirotron. And those of us that work on the Envirotron are around whenever you have questions. We also have a panel discussion a little later. Right now, we're going to move on to uh, the next presentation. And the next presentation is going to come from Marna Yando Nelson. So Marna's going to talk a little bit more about Envirotron, and she's going to tell us about an example use case for Envirotron. Something that I just learned today is that the reason that Marna works in plant science is because when she was an undergrad and was not planning on that, she had a job at Pioneer Hybrid and decided she really liked it. So she has an undergrad degree, a BS in biology from Drake University. That was when she worked as a research assistant at Pioneer Hybrid International. Then she did a PhD at Iowa State in genetics and went on to get her, uh, to do a postdoc in molecular biology at Penn State. From there, she became an associate scientist in the Department of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Molecular Biology uh, and worked at the NSF Engineering Research Center for Biorenewable Chemicals. This is called CBERC at Iowa State. Uh, right now, Marna is not only a member of the Genetics Development and Cell Biology Department, where she's an assistant professor, she also is the interim director designate for Iowa State University's Center for Metabolic Biology. And with that, I will hand you over to Marna. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, to share with everyone today our, uh, our vision for studies to conduct in the Envirotron here at Iowa State. 
Uh, we were fortunate to participate last summer in beta testing of the facility uh, as part of our research to study the effects of abiotic stress on the plant extracellular matrix. And I will be talking about that pilot study today. So um, this is one team's vision for studies that uh, could really benefit from controlled environment analysis. And I'll be talking about the first case today, um, but after having done a pilot study in the Envirotron, we started brainstorming and have come up with a second uh, research direction that we would like to um, use the Envirotron for in the future. So today I'll be talking about assessing the dynamics and protective capacity of the plant's epidermis, uh, specifically the extracellular matrix. Uh, we now have ideas of looking at the epidermis uh, bulliform cells and the protective benefits of leaf rolling as well. So first I would like to acknowledge our team. And so this is a team of faculty here at Iowa State that we have assembled to start um, thinking about and planning Envirotron type experiments to look at the plant extracellular matrix. And it's comprised of um, people from many different disciplines. Um, as we've heard today, it really takes a village to do these types of um, controlled environment phenotyping experiments. So we have um, uh, chemists, Olga Zabatina is an expert in cell wall biology. And then we have uh, geneticists, uh, bioinformaticians, uh, stati statisticians, and chemists here. Um, and a lot of the work, or all of the work I'll be talking about today is a very close collaboration with uh, Nick Lauder at the USDA here uh, in Ames. So what I'm going to be uh, talking about, what my favorite part of the plant to study is the cuticle. And so the cuticle is a hydrophobic barrier to the external environment, and it is pervasive across the biosphere. Many organisms have a cuticle, and here we have some examples. Of course, plants are um, uh, our favorite uh, organism of interest here. And in fact, the cuticle can actually be seen in a blue hosta plant. Probably you have these in your gardens, and they're definitely on campus. Uh, so the cuticle is a waxy substance uh, of fatty molecules that can accumulate. And the specific composition on a blue hosta gives it the blue color. And you can go and wipe it off, actually, and see the bright green underneath. So I challenge you to walk through campus and check that out if you haven't before. Uh, so the first line of protection between the plant and its environment is uh, the epidermal extracellular matrix. And what we mean here is the external face of the epidermis is comprised of a cell wall that consists, there's a continuum from the cell wall to the cuticle. And if we zoom in here, here is our cell wall. And then we start to have cuticular components. Uh, it's comprised of a cutin matrix uh, that's infused with cuticular lipids and then uh, topped with cuticular waxes. And so if we look at this cross section here, we can see the cell wall and cuticle. Uh, here's a nice zoomed in view. And then we have cuticular waxes that have very interesting um, architectural structures on the very surface of the plant. And depending on your plant and the composition of these cuticular waxes, they can take on different shapes. So here, these like ET finger-like projections are the cuticular waxes. And it's thought that this cuticle has, um, or it has been shown that it has many different protective roles um, as a barrier between the plant and the environment. The metabolites that are uh, form the cuticle are very hydrophobic in nature. So they have long chain hydrocarbon tails and based on their hydrophobicity uh, can provide uh, a ceiling for, um, uh, to prevent water loss during drought. Also, uh, there are many other factors um, that are many other um, protective qualities here against uh, solar radiation. It's thought as a molecular sunscreen and um, protection against pathogens and pests. So corn is our model system uh, because we are here in Iowa. It's a major crop. Um, and it's actually a very um, diverse organism. And I suppose when you drive through all the cornfields in Iowa, diversity is not something you think about when you hear the word corn. But in fact, it is very genetically diverse. And we can harness um, that diversity to tease apart these different um, protective qualities of plants. Uh, so we have looked at the extracellular matrix, uh, specifically the cuticle, 
in corn silks. Silks are very important. They're a flower part that is um, the, the stigmatic tissue of maize. And so uh, it facilitates pollination and is therefore crucial for yield. And we study the cuticle there. And we know that the cuticle changes under abiotic stress. So in a field experiment that we ran in two different summers, we are lucky enough that one summer was very hot and dry and one summer was cooler and wetter. And what we found was that in the hot, dry summer, about three quarters of the 40 different um, maize uh, inbred lines that we looked at showed up to a fourfold increase in the cuticular lipid content on the silks. And even further, the composition of about half of those uh, changed where we saw an increased number of these um, special alkenes that have um, added unsaturation in them. Uh, so we know that the cuticle changes under stress. Olga Zabatina, expert in cell walls, um, has done some uh, preliminary work in maize leaves to show that the uh, cell wall composition changes as well under stress. So here we have um, a um, experiment in which the plants were either well watered or withheld with water for 48 hours and we see a difference in carbohydrate content and then composition of the monosaccharides also changes the dark gray with vertical lines here show that xylose increases and glucose decreases um, after drought conditions. So our goal is to conduct Envirotron enabled assessment of this plant extracellular matrix <laughs> under stress. So both the cuticle and the cell wall on that outward facing portion of the cell of the epidermal cell. And so what we want to do is systematically dissect and model the relationships between the composition of this matrix and its response to abiotic stress. There's a major um, uh, gap in the understanding of the relationships uh, that exist between these compositional changes, the cuticle and cell wall properties that, that occur due to the, these compositions, and then cell growth behavior. So our approach was to select um, inbreds and hybrids to study within the Envirotron. And we're particularly interested in looking at hybrids as well. We can look at corn as a, as a model system, but of course we, we're very interested in how it behaves as a crop and how we can protect that crop. So we want to look at um, hybrids for agronomic improvement as well. So first we looked at a series of inbreds in um, the field and uh, we had eight inbreds here and we looked at cuticular lipid composition from leaves of juvenile or adult identity and we showed differences in both total and um, uh, relative composition of the different types of metabolites that accumulate on the surface. We also evaluated a series of hybrids where we took um, inbreds from the iodent or the non-stiff stock heterotic groups and we crossed them to B73. We grew out these hybrids and looked at the cuticular lipid um, profiles as well. And as you can see here, we have an increase in cuticular lipid content in the hybrids versus the inbreds, and we have a nice difference across the genotypes. So next, let's bring it into the Envirotron. And so here is the uh, large scale vision we have for a, um, a, a large study, and we only have done a pilot so far. So our diverse germplasm, eight inbreds, 12 hybrids, they're genetically diverse. Uh, and then we're going to um, measure them in uh, uh, different environmental conditions. Four temperatures that we have identified based on the temperatures that a uh, corn plant would often find during its lifetime in the Midwest, and then two watering levels. Uh, good amount of water versus water limitation. And then this is where we really get to the importance of the Envirotron, daily whole plant phenotyping, um, and with also endpoint sampling where we can look at gene expression across different conditions and different genotypes. Uh, we can uh, look at the extracellular matrix, its composition of um, cell wall and cuticle um, uh, metabolites, as well as looking at implant and metabolite composition. And of course, this will generate a very, very, very large amount of data. And so we have um, statisticians uh, to um, work on the statistical modeling of this data. So we have two working hypotheses. Um, one is that abiotic stress will trigger the remodeling of the plant extracellular matrix. And then based on that, the second hypothesis is that these program changes in the matrix will have major impacts on the plant health in response to these stresses. And so 
this is where we get to being able to look at the morphological traits and the physiological status of the plant by using the Envirotron. So here we have these different sensors, some of which um, were operational uh, during our pilot and some which weren't up and running yet. And what these uh, sensors together will allow us to do is look at different morphological traits as we have seen here, um, plant height, leaf number, leaf surface area, leaf rolling um, under stress, physiological status, so leaf temperature, stomatal conductance, photosynthetic capacity, and holy grail for me would be metabolite composition of the intact extracellular matrix. Um, I believe that that is not operational at the time, at, at this time, but that is really, um, that would be my aha ha moment <laughs> when, that, when that happens. Okay, so um, we're beta testers, and so I'm going to talk to you about the first run. Uh, so we did a pilot this past summer with the six hybrid genotypes, and we actually had those hybrids growing out in the cornfield. And so it was quite an operation. We dug them up and we brought them into the Envirotron, which was about five minutes away. Um, and then uh, we did phenotyping uh, data collection with a subset of sensors once a day, three days a week. Uh, the goal um, ultimately will be daily phenotyping, uh, hopefully more than once a day, so we could even look across the diurnal cycle. But at this time, it was three times um, a week, and so we started out, we brought the plants in, we had an acclimation period, uh, happy temperature, gave, it, gave the plants water. Uh, after 10 days, uh, I have to tell you, when we brought them in from the field, they were not happy, and so there was a long acclimation period. Uh, that was unfortunate. We then had a stress treatment with high temperature and or water limitation, and then a recovery period, and these stars are to denote the times at which the Envirotron rover took data. Uh, and so we have then looked at a couple of those time points and I'll present that. So here's our initial experimental design and this kind of takes into account the fact that we have 16 pots per chamber and how do we think about that. So what we did was we selected two temperatures um, at, at this time and we randomly uh, appointed those temperatures to four chambers each. Uh, in each of those four chambers at each temperature we then uh, either impose a well-watered or water-limited treatment. And ideally, we would want to do a split plot design where we could do uh, well-watered and um, water-limited pots within the same chamber, but at that time, it wasn't um, as feasible, so we did not do it that way. In the future, we would like to. Okay, so now I'm going to leap to a phenotyping example. So one of the sensors that was operational um, gave us thermal images. And so here we are looking at an example of the same plant, RGB images on the left, uh, during the pre-stress period, the stress period, and the recovery period. On the right is thermal image, and it doesn't show up as clearly as on my screen. Um, but here we have the thermal image using a tool that Scott Zerkor has built. We can go in and um, uh, choose select portions of the leaf. You can see, hopefully, these black lines, and they're numbered. This is where I've drawn a line across the leaf, and then it gives me the average temperature in that line, okay? And I can then export that data here. And so um, I have done this for um, one day of data collection for each of the, for the pre-stress, stress, and recovery treatments. So there's a lot more data to analyze, and I'm only looking at a little bit of it to give you a taste. And this is a very preliminary taste. Uh, this is um, the uh, rough road ahead sign, which I should steal. Um, okay, so phenotyping can be challenging. Here I show you pictures where things went pretty well. Um, but then we open up the images and we find different examples. And I can give you more examples of where things get a little more murky. Um, here, things are murky. We have a clear image, but we have lots of leaves have come to the party. So you can see all of these overlapping leaves from about six different plants. And so it becomes an uh, a untangling uh, logic puzzle to figure out what you're going to select. Uh, we can have less clear images where it's difficult to identify the leaves. And then we have dim images and then plants that are unidentifiable. And this usually happens with pots seven and 10, I have now found it. So um, maybe that's solvable in the future. Okay, so here we have our, um, some leaf temperature data that's, that's very preliminary. Um, and so 
On the top panel is our 25 degree day temperature, bottom panel is our 32 degree day temperature, left hand side is well watered on each graph and the right hand side is water limited. And uh, what we see uh, that makes sense of course is that um, during our stress condition we have an increase in temperature. Um, here at 32 degrees we see quite a big leap in temperature that then comes back um, at, during the recovery period. Interestingly, this is in the water limited um, uh, uh, treatment, well, whereas the well water treatment, there's several different genotypes in which the uh, recovery temperature in green is the same as the stress temperature. And so that's interesting and something for us to consider. I don't know if that means that the extracellular matrix has somehow changed. Um, was, these are things we want to think about and get dive into deeper. And so ultimately we want to um, uh, expand this research with this preliminary data into something that looks more like this where we're adding the endpoint analytical platforms to look at the uh, composition of the extracellular matrix as well. And I made a quick nod to the next level before as having daily metabolite phenotyping as well. There is a Raman spectrometer rover probe that, um, that is um, hopefully still in the works. And the idea here is to collect chemical composition data. It's non-destructive, it's daily. Um, and uh, this is work that's been done with, by Emily Smith's group who has already been able to look at the cell um, wall in different woody and herbaceous species uh, using Raman spectrometry. And this table is taken from one of Emily Smith's papers um, where these are just primary assignments of peaks um, from the Raman spectrometer um, data and different uh, uh, cell wall components. And there is the um, uh, possibility uh, that uh, and the cuticular lipid uh, fraction would also be identifiable. This is something that Emily Smith would be working to do. And this is great because then we would be able to have near real-time monitoring of how the uh, extracellular matrix is remodeling. And so, as I said before, I would be so excited about that. Uh, but it requires um, new measurement techniques, moving them to the probe, uh, thinking about optimization within the chambers, uh, and also building new models for uh, automated measurements and just the sheer amount of data that would come out of it. So I don't think this is trivial at all. And so finally, um, I'd like to leave you with, well, how can we use the Envirotron? And we really have to think about the size of it and how can we get clever to do the types of experiments we want to do. And as, as Steve had said, um, for many people, really, it's pick a few genotypes and do what you need to do um, and replicate chambers. And so maybe this is wild type versus mutant. Um, I don't seem to go the easy way, so that's not what I did. I used many genotypes, uh, but there's ways to handle that uh, as well. So um, again, that's uh, thinking about linking genotypes in multiple runs of the Envirotron. And not only are you replicating uh, across chambers, but you're also having to think about replicating the entire experiment in multiple runs. Uh, and so that also brings us to being clever and thinking about field to facility. And is there different ways where we can grow the plants to the, um, uh, to the maturity we want somewhere else and then load them into the Envirotron for a couple of weeks of sampling and then load them out and have a next batch to come in. So I think there's different clever things that we can think about there. So I will leave you with the larger team who really helped here. And I want to thank the Envirotron team for letting us do beta testing. Uh, Steve has been great. Uh, Scott Zerichor and Anthony Chapman and Yin Bao have been fantastic helping um, shepherd me through this process. So thank you. Right, so um, I think that's a great question. I am not going to remember the time it took to go from chamber one to chamber eight. It was a few hours, Ben? Yeah. Yes, okay. So um, definitely, you, I, 
I think that we need to start thinking about that and, and, and deciding, well, do we need to run the rover if that's possible in a different order uh, or um, at different times or, uh, um, uh, but in, in this case, it was run, you know, over a two hour period and we run it at the same time each run. So, but yes, it is a concern. Yes. So you had some kind of specific question to address when you took plans out of the field in the Russian Right. So yes. So there's a couple of reasons to do, to do that. One, uh, and, and so we would like to conduct these types of experiments in both ways. So one advantage of bringing them in from the field is that they have um, they've been grown in a field environment, and so if we want to think more about a crop. We have that ability to do so. We were um, pretty careful about our digging and such, but of course there's going to be damage. Uh, there also was the fact that we had those varieties available to us at the time relative to when we could get into the Envirotron. Uh, and we really wanted to, to not um, phenotype them as seedlings, but as um, um, larger plants. Yeah, so uh, definitely we see the concerns. So we have a panel discussion a little bit later, and so that we don't get further behind, I, I think we should thank